Trunks returns to his future and quickly gets to work dispatching the number 17 and number 18 of his timeline. Their behavior here is a jarring reminder of how different they are from their counterparts. Shooting an old man in the face with his own gun is pretty grim, even for Dragon Ball. In 1993, Trunks is going around in his tank top without the jacket, but he's not carrying his sword, so I still technically stand by what I said about him never wearing this configuration of outfit, as flimsy as that might be. And in the time it took me to say that, he has killed them both. Now all he has to do is wait for Cell. I suppose, since he did the exact same thing in the main timeline, that he could simply go to Dr. Garrow's underground lab and take care of Cell before he matures, but Cell's exposition must be maintained. So instead, Trunks waits three years and pantomimes emotions of going back to the past to visit everyone and tell them that his future is safe and is being rebuilt. I wonder if he's still planning on going back prior to a point where he'd met any of them. But obviously, First Form Cell is hardly a match for everything Trunks has been through, and he is quickly killed as well. As we see this little blob of a drawing that is ostensibly Bluma running towards him, the narration informs us that Trunks has indeed brought peace to his time. All that hard work, all that suffering, all that loss. It's so wonderful that Trunks has finally succeeded in wiping out the threats that have defined his entire life. It would be such a shame if some unnecessary sequel 25 years later treated his home like a disposable battleground, and wiped all of it away. The Cell arc is a storyline that I find fascinating in many ways. It certainly finishes in a place far flung from where it began, which is not necessarily bad. There are tons of twists and turns, the story reinvents itself in many places, most certainly more than any arc before it, it leaves the audience frequently guessing where it's going to go. Its titular villain isn't even introduced until the 8th episode of my review! One of my complaints about Dragon Ball Super storytelling is how stagnant it feels. One need look no further than the Cell arc to find a storyline that is constantly on the move, always adding in new elements, always finding ways to stay fresh. Unfortunately, the flip side of that is that much of that movement is predicated on lack of planning, last-minute rewrites, and characters forced to act like idiots or vastly out of character, and it shows. Boy, does it show. It comes across as very sloppy a lot of the time. Quite frankly, time travel, a serious time travel story, is far out of Toriyama's depth as a writer. These are the kinds of stories that necessitate careful planning and keeping up with minute logistics. That does not play to Toriyama's strengths. However, surprisingly, it's also the arc's saving grace. So many of its problems and potential plot holes are at least mitigated by hand-waving them away as time travel did it. And the ability to be able to play fast and loose is what helps give the story its unpredictability and allow it to succeed far more than it really deserves to. That Toriyama is so often able to look at the direction of the story and determine where it needs to go in order to wring out the most drama demonstrates his strengths as a writer. I suppose for me, one of my biggest disappointments is how much lip service it pays to past events while actually drawing very little from them. It honestly does feel that the only reason the Red Ribbon Army elements were brought into this was because it allowed Toriyama to come up with villains without having to craft a reason for them to be there. Revenge! Nice and simple. Anyone can understand that. And, you know, perhaps that is for the best. I know it's not the general consensus to hold that arc in as high a regard as I do. And as I admitted all those years ago, a lot of the characters specific to that arc aren't interesting enough to warrant coming back. And given that Dragon Ball is a series for kids, and that arc had premiered in the magazines half a decade earlier, perhaps he was afraid to deeply reference something a lot of his younger readers might not remember. However, I can't help but feel there was a woefully missed opportunity here. Many people, myself included, complain about the lack of a connection between Gohan and number 16 when the pivotal moment arrives. 
Ultimately, number 16 is a character who does very little, is given next to no opportunity to connect with the audience, and serves no other purpose than to be a sacrificial lamb. To me, the solution is obvious. We have a red ribbon artificial human who is ridiculously strong but is considered a failure due to his peaceful nature? Um, haven't we done that before? Number 16, intentionally or not, is little more than a copy of Hachan. I mean, geez, even his number is simply taking eight and doubling it. Like with Yamcha's line about wanting a baby, I'd almost be inclined to believe Toriyama acknowledged it on purpose. I don't see why he couldn't have been a souped-up brainwashed number eight as a villain. With the proper care, it could have had so much more emotional resonance. Dr. Garrow's revenge would have struck more deeply, turning Goku's friend into a villain, a villain in conflict who still loves nature, but cannot shake the bit of programming that he has to kill Son Goku above all else. Once he overcomes that and allies himself with the good guys in order to fight Cell, Goku can introduce this old friend to his son. They can spend time together during the days leading up to the Cell games. And then when he makes the sacrifice play, there's enough of a bond there that it would wound both Goku and Gohan. He's a character who's expendable enough to be disposed of, yet he has enough of a connection to actually matter. And it could have made the Red Ribbon events actually matter. I know I can't be the only person who's considered number 8 in this type of role, as three years later, Toei would cast him as exactly that in a movie retelling the Red Ribbon portions of the story. As I mentioned a few episodes ago, though, this arc does draw on a lot of Dragon Ball lore from other story arcs, be it Piccolo's connection to God or the return of a tournament based on the Tenkaichi Budokai. Given Goku's supposed exit from the series, Tenshinhan's randomly chosen departure, as well as the next generation feel that the following arc will have, at least for a little while, the Cell arc does feel like the end of a classic era. Obviously, Dragon Ball has evolved significantly over the course of its run, and a lot of the elements that distance the Boo arc from previous material will be reset hard. But this still feels like an ending of sorts, one of the most definitive endings in the series. That probably contributes to the ongoing fan rumor that, like the Frieza arc, Toriyama intended to end the series here. There has been nothing to support such a statement. But at the very least, as it is ultimately structured, the story does come to an end. It's not like the Frieza arc that leads into the next story in the very same chapter. There is a definitive cap. Obviously, that has no bearing on whether or not Toriyama intended either at some point to close out the series, but given how definitively this caps things off as it is, as well as how different the Boo arc feels at the beginning, I can see why fans would draw such a conclusion. A common criticism I see leveled against this arc is how it fits in as a worthy follow-up to the Frieza arc. Frieza is, to this day, treated as Dragon Ball's ultimate villain, to the point that they keep bringing him back long past the point he had any relevancy. While I continue to doubt the artistic merits of doing so, it indicates better than I ever could just how iconic he is. And as I said when I opened this arc, building up the stakes of a story after it's been to space is difficult. The entire planet is a battlefield. The entire planet is destroyed. Goku comes face to face with the man who wiped out his people. Vegeta passes the torch to his greatest rival. Goku transforms into the stuff of legends. Now we're back on Earth and some rinky-dink scientist in a cave with a box of scraps creates robots who are stronger than Frieza? Please. No. Just no. It doesn't bother me. None of it. Over the last 17 videos, it should be clear, I have no problem zeroing in on what I think are the multitude of problems with this arc, but the validity of the existence of its villains is not one of them. While we have seen amazing technology far beyond that of Earth from the various alien species we've met, let's not forget that Earth possesses technology and skills that those aliens do not. Seriously, capsules? The ability to shrink an object of any size down to a tiny bauble? Who else has that? Technological development isn't necessarily linear. The Mechians possess space travel superior to Earth, but live in huts made of their own dung? Mecha Frieza looks like a ridiculous patch job. I can very readily believe that Dr. Garrow has a better hand on robotics. More importantly, this arc possesses its own built-in justification. The villains are only as strong as they are because Goku and his friends are as strong as they are. While the concept of Goku's failure to keep from attracting bad guys doesn't work for me, at all, that these villains are a direct result of Goku's strength does. With the initial waves of artificial humans, Dr. Gero imitates their skills. With Cell, 
he flat out copies them. Using our own character's skills and powers as a base from which to draw inspiration, I see no problem with such creatures being able to exist. However, given that this is the arc that enforces the idea that the Dragon Ball world is a normal place, I can see how this premise would be jarring for some. As the series, again for the moment, is being set up to center around Gohan and his inner circle rather than Goku and his, that does mean that certain characters will be further diminished with that classic fighting crew really getting their last hurrah here, although as I've enumerated, a lot of them ultimately contribute very little. Most of the characters I've dealt with in individual episodes, so I won't waste time repeating myself. In short, Chaozu misses the boat entirely, Pu'er is teased for no reason at all, Oolong, is he even here? He's at the barbecue, that's it. Yamcha's character is assassinated until he's thrown a bone at the end, just like at the end of the Freeza arc. Tenshinhan gets stuff to do, but ultimately has no real role or growth. None of the three sideline Frieza art characters gets to show off any real fruits of Kaio's training, and here's something worth keeping in mind. Each volume of the original Tonko Bone collection of this series always begins with the main characters page. That page evolves over time, introducing new characters, pruning out characters whose roles have diminished, and updating their looks. Once those characters die off in the Saiyan arc, they're taken off the characters page, which makes sense, they're not there. When Piccolo comes back to life, he's added back. When these guys come back, they never reappear on the characters page. Piccolo gets green ball just as badly as he did in the Freeze arc. Kurdidian is given a nice storyline with ethical dilemmas and heart. While it's left open-ended, his relationship with number 18 is given enough that you can connect the dots. It's ironic that he achieves Yamcha's dream at the same time Yamcha's crashes and burns. Vegeta is whiny and arrogant and everyone accepts him even when he makes their lives infinitely more complicated. Goku is at his worst of this arc, at least in terms of original Dragon Ball. He's far too reckless, never has to answer for his mistakes, and then fake mistakes are given to him to atone for instead. Gohan makes far too little of an impression in order to take over the hero role. Trunks, however, is a gem of a character, and it's no wonder he's as popular as he is. He's one of the few Dragon Ball characters who never gets a chance to overstay his welcome. He's a main character for this arc and this arc only. Then he leaves. He doesn't stick around in a diminished capacity, and I really think that helps his reputation. He has the greatest introduction of probably any Dragon Ball character ever. He has clear goals and motivations, he's pragmatic and ruthless because of his environment, but he's also polite and shy. He simultaneously serves as a prophet and the fish out of water. Trunks can explain future events to these characters, but he struggles to live in the present. He's Kyle Reese from The Terminator. He only knows these people secondhand and then has to actually interact with them and separate the reality from the image he's been holding. And that's especially true in regards to his relationship with Vegeta. While I don't feel Vegeta is handled nearly as deftly as he was in the Frieza arc, giving him conflict with the time-traveling son causes his character to not feel as if he's just along for the ride, even though his I'm hanging out at the barbecue gives that impression. He has brand new territory to traverse. And Trunks' one major moment to not be pragmatic and not take down the enemy at the first opportunity is because his dad is his weakness. There really is no other character in this series as brooding and damaged as Trunks, yet he never crosses that line into dour and unpleasant to watch. Now that I think about it, his unique juxtaposition of character traits makes him a better future Gohan than future Gohan is. Similar to how the Saiyan arc rescued Kurdidin from the scrap heap, this arc does wonders for Bluma after the last several arcs had done very little with her. I'd say this arc defines her prominence for the remainder of the series, and her role here serves as a prototypical example of how she'll be used in modern Dragon Ball series. While it's certainly not a new role, this story has ample room for a tech guru, and it's nice to see someone have a significant role that is not that of a fighter. In this arc, Mr. Satan almost feels like an unnecessary addition. He enters the story so late and contributes so little, Thankfully, his shtick does not manage to get old. His deception here of the entire world serves as an establishing character moment for how he will function from this point on. Obviously, that does not tie into the story of this arc, and I would hardly say he's at his best here, but he could have been a lot worse. The villains all have their moments, but Cell is just handled so haphazardly in his introduction that he's never able to regain the level of menace and mystery he came onto the scene with. Ultimately, he transforms into Diet Frieza, and the other villains are sidelined because of his being shoehorned into the story. Setting up different villainous factions and arranging those chess pieces on the board is still fun to watch, but it doesn't hold a candle to the power plays and upsets of the early Frieza arc. 
Something I will bring up in regards to this arc is how I frequently hear that early Dragon Ball is the Goku show, while the post-Raditz material grants other characters a chance at the spotlight, so that it becomes more of an ensemble story, especially here. To an extent I can agree with that, Goku's demotion to plot device savior means the story is frequently attempting to get him out of the way, which means that other characters are forced into focus. But I can only agree with that up to a point, and I cannot agree with the use of the word ensemble. Ensemble implies that there is no singular star, that everyone has a significant role to play. The majority of roles the other characters inhabit is to fail repeatedly until Goku comes to save them. And while Goku's role is subverted to an extent in this arc, given that he is around at the beginning and cedes the hero role to Gohan at the end, that trope is still very much in effect. It is Goku putting all the wheels into motion. It's Goku they're waiting for when he's sick. It's Goku who suggests the Room of Spirit in time. It's Goku everyone's waiting on when he's training. It's Goku who makes the plans for the Cell games. It's Goku Cell wants to fight. It's Goku who puts Gohan into his new position. It's Goku who keeps Gohan from giving up. Everything still revolves around Goku, while the remaining cast run around like chickens with their heads cut off until he arrives to clean up their messes. Sure, the other characters have the occasional small moment that contributes something, but most of them are like Piccolo. They appear to have meaning and consequence, but ultimately serve as nothing but red herrings for the audience, making us believe they're important. It's become a problem with Dragon Ball that Bluma's exception here highlights. Hardly anyone has exclusive skills anymore, not really. Sure, they all have characteristic moves, but those moves all basically serve the same function. To hurt things. They're all fighters, and they all do the same things. Because of how Dragon Ball is structured, it means that ultimately, only the single strongest guy matters. With a few token exceptions, everyone else might as well just stay at home. If you want to see Dragon Ball utilize an ensemble cast, I can only think of one case where that is legitimately true. The first arc. There you have a balanced mix of fighters, tech geniuses, and shapeshifters that all bring necessary traits to the table, coupled with problems that are more diverse than simply punching something until it dies. But very quickly that aspect of the series goes away. I don't want you to think I'm blaming this arc specifically for this problem, as it's present to a degree in most of them, but I feel it really reaches its peak here, where the story is now bloated with characters who have nothing to do. Yes, earlier Dragon Ball is Goku-centric as well, but at least it's upfront about it. It doesn't regularly kick Goku to the curb just to pad out its runtime. I feel there are two ways this problem could have been averted. One would be to restructure Dragon Ball's fights to be more strategic, so that each character could specialize in certain aspects of fighting that are unique to them and make each one necessary to the overall group. Someone focuses on power, another on stealth or speed. No one character would have the advantage in every area of fighting. The best we have here is making Kuririn the medic by allowing him to hold a sack of beans. Similarly, the alternative would be to retire certain characters from fighting, but make them useful in other ways, like Bluma, or how Batgirl transitions to Oracle. But of course, for that to work would require more diverse problems. Something I've had to examine over the course of Dragon Ball Dissection is what makes a story work. And that's... a very broad topic. But the fact of the matter is, there are all kinds of stories one can tell. For example, when I look at Dragon Ball's Piccolo arc versus its Cell arc, well, they aren't as different as stories can be. We're not looking at a romantic comedy versus a war picture. They're both stories about a green monster trying to take over the world and gloating about it on television, while various martial artists figure out ways to take said monster down. However, the Piccolo arc is very straightforward and to the point. This is the guy. We know who he is, we know what he wants, he gets this thing, we get this thing, we kill him. Piccolo is present from the beginning. Goku systematically gets revenge and then a power-up. The Cell arc opens with the return of an old villain who's really only there to show off this new character. These are the guys. We know who they are. We know what they want. Whoops, never mind. It's not those guys either. It's this guy and these guys do other things and time travel made things different. And that training didn't work, but this one is different. I'm not saying one is right and the other is wrong. They're just different. The Piccolo arc tells a very simple story without a lot of bumps in the road. Elements progress from A to B to C and so on. The Cell arc tells a much more complicated story that requires charts and timelines to figure out. The rules are changing constantly. The former plays more to Toriyama's strengths as a writer, the latter does not. Generally speaking, as much as I love a twisted complex web of a story, 
I'd rather see a simple story done well than watch a complex story become complicated. I admire ambition, but it's sometimes painfully awkward to see ambition so deftly escape a storyteller's grasp. And I say the Piccolo arc is much more solidly constructed than this arc is. However, the Piccolo arc is also derivative and not nearly as fun. As I said, for all the times this story falls into a ditch and twists its ankle, it succeeds far more than it really has any business doing. And that's why, ultimately, I award the Cell Arc... ...a 3 out of 10. Yes, this is the arc that five years ago I switched with the Piccolo arc. Prior to that time, I had firmly decided on giving this one the two. But once I actually reviewed the Piccolo arc, I had to admit that this story just gets a lot more done. Oh, it's messy, to be sure. And it's close. They both succeed and fail in different ways. But the time travel veneer is utilized just skillfully enough to make enough of its failings come out the other end looking okay. So for once, complicated trumps simple. Obviously, that leaves the Boo arc to take the score of 1. It's just as messy as the Cell arc, but doesn't have those redeeming excuses to bump it over the edge. That doesn't mean there's not a lot to love, though. There is. The Boo arc contains quite a lot of material, some truly sublime ideas, and just as many narrative pratfalls. I'm obviously not here today to explain why that arc gets the bottom score. That will be in the future when we cover the Majin Buu arc in its entirety. Finishing up the Cell arc makes me feel very satisfied, though, as so many topics that caused me to want to start Dragon Ball Dissection occurred in this arc. I'm very proud of the videos that have come out of this story, and I hope all of you found them enjoyable. When we return to Dragon Ball Dissection, it will be the first DBD TV since 2017, as we cover the next two animated story arcs, beginning with the Frieza arc. See you there! Mr. Fusion and Dragon Ball Dissection are brought to you in part by viewers like you, donating through Patreon. 